So Francisca, what is your area of expertise and how does your research relate to Buddhism and science dialogue? Yeah, I work on uh, the expression of Buddhist thought in China and Korea through artistic media, uh, fiction, poetry, and film more, more recently. And then, of course, uh, I've been interested in the dialogue between Buddhism and science, and I published a book on the topic in 2016. And the focus of that is to take a Buddhist perspective on the conflict between religion and science in modern Western society and uh, suggest uh, a Buddhist approach to thinking about that conflict and possibly even um, getting beyond it. It's somewhat ambitious, but it's, it's a certain idea of a new way of thinking of the relationship between um, particularly theism and science at the narrative level. In your view, how might the current Buddhism and science dialogue improve? I feel like the current dialogue between Buddhism and science is uh, limited in that science and scientific modes of knowledge functions as the, um, the authority, if you will, the standard uh, by which both Buddhist thought, whether it's, uh, um, you know, it's philosophical or um, doctrinal traditions, say the belief in rebirth and heavens and hells, that would be an obvious example, the doctrine of karma, and uh, Buddhist practices, meditation being the primary one, um, are evaluated. So science is the subject evaluating Buddhism as the object. And I think that's been really interesting and helpful, a helpful way of bringing Western scientists and philosophers um, into a conversation where they can start to examine Buddhist tradition. But the limitation of that is that subject-object positionality. And so I feel like the dialogue between the two can be put on a deeper footing or a new footing uh, if we use Buddhist um, forms of knowledge, uh, Buddhist epistemology, in other words, uh, Buddhist ideas about the nature of knowledge, its limits, uh, and so forth, and use that to examine scientific practices and assumptions. So reverse the positionality so that Buddhism and Buddhist thought is in the subject position, observing, commenting on, and even critiquing um, scientific knowledge, and particularly the deep level assumptions on the part of scientists and philosophers about what they're engaged in discovering uh, and what science um, produces as a mode of knowledge uh, because it has claims to a certain universal validity and objectivity when it comes to scientific knowledge. So I think that would bring more balance to the conversation. What are some of the commonplace assumptions about the nature of science that you think bear closer examination? I'm, I think science thinks that it's fundamentally in the process of uncovering the deep objective structure of reality, um, whether it's at the macro level of cosmology, the universe, um, or the micro level, uh, the most subatomic uh, uh, phenomenal events. Um, I don't want to caricature the scientific point of view because uh, there are many very intelligent, deeply reflective scientists um, who will say, no, that's, that's overly simplistic. Uh, with, and I agree with that view. But I think there is a um, inevitable um, default view that science is in the process of giving us the best, the most rigorous, the most ascertainable, demonstrable, um, knowledge uh, 
of our world. Um, and that comes with a very, very fundamental assumption that there is an external reality out there to be discovered that is independent of us, independent of the observing subject. Um, and it's that level of assumption that I think Buddhist philosophy can helpfully question and um, start a conversation with scientists about regarding that very assumption, uh, which presumes the separation of the knowing subject, that would be the scientist, and the external world out there, that is the object of knowledge. So this goes to uh, what, uh, what in the field of philosophy would be known as epistemology. And that means that scientists have default uh, epistemological assumptions and that those assumptions have a history because they come from a certain place. You can generally identify it as ancient Greek philosophy, um, but you know modern versions of it. But the point that, yeah, scientists have a certain assumption about the nature of knowledge is, I think, sometimes not uh, at the level of conscious awareness. And this is where a conversation with Buddhist epistemological views can help bring these assumptions to a level of awareness. And I, I think that can also have really beneficial social, cultural, um, implications because there is tension now between scientific worldviews and um, theistic religious worldviews, but I think also humanistic worldviews. There is a culture war, and uh, I think science is at the heart of it. I wonder if you could give us a few examples of how bringing the Buddhist worldview into conversation with science reveals hidden assumptions of science. Yeah, I think uh, the modern Western scientific enterprise has a certain set of assumptions. Um, first having to do with this separation between um, human minds and the world uh, that it's trying to describe. So. Uh, you might say uh, it's like the camera view of knowledge where uh, the human mind is like a camera uh, taking a picture of what's out there and hopefully taking a picture that is reflective, right? Photographic of what is actually out there rather than distorted uh, by you know, various mental errors, misperceptions, and so forth. So this view of inside uh, and outside, which I call subject-object dualism. So that, that would be one major assumption. Part of that assumption is, again, this notion of a mind-independent reality. That's the holy grail, right? Let's get at, take a photograph of, of the world out there without the interference of human subject, wishful thinking, desires, distortions, cultural bias, uh, all of those things. So, you know, this sort of bias-free picture of the world. So that, that's a huge framing assumption. And I think a second major assumption of um, what has been the history of uh, modern Western science is the belief that that external reality uh, is made up of things, um, objects. That's uh, maybe the easiest to um, exemplify in the world of uh, the natural sciences, right? Uh, physics is the study of matter. Biology is the study of the physical body. <laughs> but uh, chemistry would be... Um, more at the molecular level. So that all of these things that uh, at least the natural sciences are studying are objects in the world. Okay, and, and I think that assumption is so automatic uh, 
that no one even talks about it. I mean, the, the feeling is, of course, that's what the world is made up of, stuff, objects. But it's possible to think about the world in an entirely different way, and I think that's what Buddhist um, thought uh, presents to us, that there aren't things out there in the world, but rather events that do not possess any kind of, it, 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 these events don't happen in things or in stuff, but that, that's simply all there is, events in the world. So uh, that goes back to the basic Buddhist analysis of the self or personhood that says the person is made up of a whole bunch of different kinds of events, but there is no stuff, there is no substance um, to being a person. Even the body is made up of all sorts of events that you can look at, you know, at the microscopic level. Uh, and when you do, you see that there's nothing but movement and change and processes, but there's no stable matter or um, object. Meditation is usually thought of as deconstructive. But you have pointed out that meditation has a powerful constructive dimension. Can you explain what's at stake in that distinction? Okay, so the current conversation about uh, the study of meditation uh, defines meditation as a process in which um, we can deconstruct our illusions, uh, I think our uh, kind of unskillful mental affliction that causes distortion and ultimately uh, suffering. And uh, I think that's a very useful conversation and um, reflective of indigenous Buddhist conversations uh, about liberation, that we need to get beyond our illusions because our illusions cause suffering. And I think the most, or at least one, real paradigmatic metaphor for that is the snake and the rope, where there's a coiled um, you know, bundle of rope and we mistake it for a snake. And because of this faulty perception, you know, it results in suffering, fear, reactivity, and so forth. So the idea of you know, cutting through uh, these uh, misperceptions is, is a good way of thinking about meditation. Um, I look at East Asian Buddhism, primarily ch uh, Chinese and Korean, and uh, because of their own cultural um, orientation, they're, I don't know, they're, uh, they like to think more positively, you might say, <laughs> or optimistically, and they tend to have a, um, uh, you know, positive attitude toward, uh, about ordinary life. Uh, they don't uh, generally think of life beyond the present world and think more in terms of realizing, uh, if you want to call it awakening or nirvana or the Tao, you know, in this world. So. Uh, what I've looked at in Buddhist tradition is how the concept of meditation also includes the idea of the imagination and how positively that can function. And it, it's a very simple uh, logical premise. If our perception of the world is fundamentally an illusion in the sense that it's a mental construct, it's something that we imagine, but most of the time, we imagine the world in ways that are harmful to our own selves, right? That causes pain and psychic distress. Then it, it, it follows that we can imagine the world in different ways, in more skillful ways, um, so that we change our experience of the same reality. So what was originally a very distressful experience of a situation can be experienced as um, not distressful and maybe even, you know, beneficial in some way. So um, what was once seen to be the problem 
our imagination <laughs> can also be the solution, can, uh, can be the path to achieving the goal of cutting through our delusions and illusions. That, that's why I've looked at how Buddhist philosophy has um, been expressed through uh, the literary arts uh, and aesthetic experience, because I, I think this aspect of Buddhism has been really emphasized and developed uh, in East Asia. So, the, so that um, it's, it's been stated that um, pursuing the arts is no different from pursuing Buddhist practice. Um, and I think that's a message that a lot of people can relate to. Uh, it's as simple as when you listen to a piece of music, if you really think about it, 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 it's magical. I mean, a piece of music that really moves you because instantaneously, almost instantaneously, you're transported. Your whole state of mind, your whole experience of reality has been completely transformed. Everybody relates to that, but I, I don't think they think about it as some sort of magical, mystical, profound experience. Although I, I think, you know, everyone can tell you about how important music is to them. Maybe some more than others. It could be a different art form. You know, it could be visual arts, or it may not even be something that you would recognize or define as art at all, because of course, that's also a cultural category. Um, for me, looking at a photograph of my children is a similar type of experience. It takes me out of my present reality and puts me in a space uh, where I know that the feeling is just going to be marvelous, you know, where I smile without even being aware of it and the feelings that I have just in, in looking, meditating, if you will, or contemplating an image of my children just makes me feel so good. And you know what? I can do it any time I want. So I, that aspect of uh, meditation as a cultivation of, uh, of um, wholesome mental states um, is the other half, the reconstructive side of meditation. Is meditation, in some sense, an art form? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yes. So my definition of art and both contemplation is that it calls into existence, right, um, a intentional state of being, uh, an intentional experience. People generally think that Buddhism is grounded in philosophy. You've suggested it's grounded in aesthetics. Why? So my view that um, Buddhist philosophy or Buddhist uh, tradition is grounded in aesthetics um, comes from the fact that, you know, it's very clear in the early discourses about the Buddha that he was not interested in answering typically philosophical or metaphysical questions about what is the ultimate nature or state of the world? Um, he uses language uh, and he lays out the Eightfold Path and talks about things like right view, right? Which uh, seems to suggest that it's important, Buddhism, that you have the right views as opposed to the wrong views. And so in that sense, Buddhism does sound like a philosophy. But, um, I would say it's not a philosophy in the sense of doing metaphysics, trying to discover and describe what the world ultimately is. The Buddha made it very clear in these early texts. He's not interested in that. He's interested in the nature of human experience, right? That's why he says, I'm only interested in what happens within the six uh, senses, you know, the, the six uh, sensory fields. So the question is, how do we sense things uh, due to stimuli coming in from outside um, of my, you know, sort of internal uh, mental field? 
how do I respond to them? How do I categorize it? How, what emotions uh, uh, does that stimulus evoke for me? So this is all about aesthetics. Aesthetics, um, I think in its most bare definition, has to do with sensory experience. And it was distinguished from logical or rational operations. So it's our sensory um, um, sort of uh, mode of being in the world. And um, suffering is the result of a certain way of experiencing our sensory being in the world. Um, and liberation is by the same token a transformation, a radical transformation in that very same phenomenon. So ultimately, it's about how we feel and experience the world and not about what is there in the world. You are calling for a Buddhist science. What would a Buddhist science look like? And how would it be different from what we already think of as science? Yeah, I think a Buddhist science is possible in which the ordinary activities of science can still unfold as it is already unfolding. But the difference is the framing assumptions. Um, going back to the two assumptions that I identified as being present in um, Western science presently, that is the assumption that there's a mind-independent world and that the world comprises things uh, that we can ultimately get to the bottom of so that we know in fundamental essence what the world is made of. What if we conducted science, empirical science, with observations, co data collection, verification, measurement, and so forth, but assuming instead that there is no world, external world, independent of my observation of it, um, and that the world uh, that I observe and describe um, is really made up of events and processes rather than things or stuff. I think you could do science as it's presently conducted with those two assumptions and not have any disruption uh, of the basic methods um, and practices of science. But the benefit would be that the story of science, the stories emanating from scientific practices would change. And I think um, one major change in that story will be um, that scientific, the scientific way of knowing the world and other ways of knowing the world, whether it's aesthetic or religious, um, are on the same footing. It's an equal playing field in contrast to the idea that um, something like scientific knowledge is uh, valid, objective, whereas religious knowledge uh, and ways of seeing the world is a mere fantasy or a form of wish fulfillment. So I, I, I think uh, this idea that Science is about getting at the truth, whereas the humanities or religions are uh, about getting at the warm and fuzzy uh, realm of feelings and meaningfulness and morality uh, would be uh, leveled out. Because I think in this distinction of knowledge realms, there really is a hierarchy. There, there really is a, um, um, a value system that says the scientific form of knowledge is more solid and more important, uh, ultimately, than these more humanistic ways of knowing. And, and you can see that clearly in social policy and in you know, the current uh, jeopardy in uh, funding for the humanities and uh, our arts departments and programs. And I don't think it's just a matter of each discipline fighting, you know, for its own survival and representation. I, I think we're talking about um, 
human lives and um, the quality of life and also uh, the real danger of the incredible diminishing of our perception of what human life is, you know, that, that I, I think will result in, in suffering for all beings. So are you saying what's at stake is the narrative of what it means to be human? Yes, I th uh, so I uh, like to think about narratives. I talk about narratives all the time. It's, it's a helpful way for me, uh, for me to, I guess, describe what's at stake. And so I think even if science is fundamentally about observation and collecting data, inevitably stories arise from it because human beings tell stories um, and um, we have a lot of latitude in the stories that we can tell on the basis of scientific observations. Uh, think about um, evolutionary theory and that's all obviously observation and evidence based but um, it, it, it's been more popular to tell the story of competition and strife and nature red in tooth and claw and species extinction and domination and adaptation. Um, I think it's a way of enlivening the observations, but humans cannot stop from telling stories. And going back to this idea that Buddhism is ultimately based on aesthetics, narrative and storytelling is an art form and the reason why stories are important is because we become, we fulfill the stories that we tell, all right? So if you tell the story that, um, based on evolution, that life is a matter of competition uh, and domination, then that is the reality that we enact and that we in gender, I think this is what the Dalai Lama's own message is over and over again, this um, human tendency to fulfill our own narratives. We live by our imaginations and they create our experiences of the world. Um, so yes, I, I'm worried about the stories that we tell about who we are when, when we let uh, certain default narratives that science can tend towards. Um, I think it, it really does have a very concrete impact on our lives. Which seemingly intractable problems of science might be solved by Buddhist science? Yes, yeah, so I think one, um, intractable problem uh, in current philosophy of science and philosophy of mind is the mind-body problem. Um, and it, it, it can be described quite simply as the mind is an entity, an essence that has no extension in space, whereas the body is the opposite, you know, it has solidity and it has extension in space. So this is based on, again, the idea that the world is made up of objects, of stuff. So you have mind stuff and body stuff. And because they're defined as being, you know, um, oppositional, uh, then you create this intractable problem, logical problem of how do the mind and body interact? That would be one version of it. Another related uh, problem is how does the brain, which is body and made up of matter stuff, give rise to consciousness and mind, which is not made up of matter stuff. And this is called the hard problem of, of consciousness. And uh, much ink is spilled on, you know, trying to get around uh, this logical conundrum. And I don't think it will ever be resolved because the terms of the problem are such that it's irresolvable, right? And uh, I think in a manner of speaking, the whole problem and riddle 
is a pure mental construction in and of itself. <laughs> um, so if you thought about the mind and body as being events and processes rather than objects that have oppositional qualities, then you no longer have this conundrum of how to two opposing kinds of substances and objects ever associate with each other in terms of either interacting or one that is the body giving rise to the other, the mind. So in Buddhist descriptions of the mind and body, and they, they have that dualistic uh, or that dichotomous, you know, labeled as well, the mind and the body, but what it observes is that they are certain kinds of events that most importantly require each other um, to be sustained. So the mind needs the body to have an object of awareness uh, and also to arise. I mean, um, mind arises in dependence on the body. Uh, for example, um, sensations without a body you can't have, you know, sense organs, nose, ears, and so forth, uh, then that makes contact with sensory stimuli and then allows the possibility of, like, visual consciousness. Um, so you see how the mind requires the body to function, and then uh, physical experiences require the mind um, to be experienced at all. So if the mind is not uh, aware and paying attention to certain sensory stimuli, then that event does not occur. I mean, if you're absorbed in reading a book, you don't hear uh, the bird singing outside of, of the window, or you know, um, you're not aware of this tactile sensation of your clothes uh, against your skin. It's just uh, not there. So. Um, it's interesting how these different assumptions give rise to very different stories about the mind-body relationship. And um, uh, aside from allowing for philosophers to, uh, to make careers and publish articles on the mind-body problem, um, I, I feel like you know, there are aspects of that supposed problem which then feeds into this larger narrative about the priority of matter or if you recognize matter as the only verifiable uh, object in the world, then consciousness is an illusion. I mean, you, you get the arising of all sorts of very diminishing stories about the nature of mind that I, I think, again, affects um, our experience of ourselves and our being in the world.